Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Berahot, Chapter 5, Halacha 1. And now we're going to be talking about the frame of mind that you have to have when you're doing the Shemona Esrei. Now, one of the key things is we always want to be doing it where our mind is in the prayer and we're, we're not having any distractions. And this is going to start to talk about explanations on why that is, how it comes to be, and so that you can really get an, an idea about the, the seriousness about having to keep your mind in the prayer and keep your mind in the game and why that is so important and how come. You know, we've been talking in chapter four that the prayer is really like paralleled to the, the offerings. And just like you're not allowed to bring a blemished offering, you're also, you know, if the prayer is being modeled on the, the, um, on the offerings, then it would also be a problem to bring a blemished prayer. So that is why you would have a problem with passing wind during the prayer, as it says in chapter four, that, you know, there's a good chance that your prayer is not going to be answered because you're bringing a blemished offering. And it's the same thing about, you know, you're not, it's not, it's like you're not bringing, you know, the best ram or something. You're bringing a ram that's, eh, Okay, is it's just not so good, right? Not even even if not necessarily blemished, but just not so good. And it's the same idea there that you want to you know have your concentration in there and really be present with your mind in the prayer because that is really like bringing a better quality ram when you're bringing an offering. And so when you are thinking about your prayer in terms of hey, this is really the substitute for sacrifice. And, you know, we see even in the story of Cain and Abel, when, you know, Abel was bringing a good quality sacrifice and Cain wasn't, Hashem comes to Cain and says, you know, fix yourself. Like, you know, you can improve, you can improve yourself, but, you know, don't bring low quality offerings to me. And there was nothing wrong with the offering that Cain had brought. It just wasn't a good quality one. He could have brought a better one. And you can too, you know. The prayer is a substitute for the korban, and just like if your mind is all over the place and you're not really concentrating, it's no different really than you bringing not necessarily even a blemished one, but just a low quality one, and you're kind of more in the category of Cain, and Hashem really doesn't want that. Hashem doesn't really want, you can see from the story of Cain, right, like Cain did give an offering, right? He checked that box, right? He, he gave an offering. There's nothing wrong with his offering. But he could have done better. And, you know, Cain could have, you know, for his means have done better. And, you know, it was really, really what we see with Cain is he was just checking the box just to do it. But that's not really what was in his heart. It's not really what he wanted to do. And it's the same thing when you stand there and pray. If you are standing there and your head is not really in the game, and you're kind of distracted, and you're kind of not really thinking about this, it's no different than when you're bringing an offering just like Cain, because, yeah, it's you're checking a box, you did it, but is that really, is that, did you really do the better quality one? No. Mishnah gets going and starts to say, one should not stand to pray the Shemona Esrei prayer, except amid an attitude of submission. Now, this is talking about uh, in the Rashi, in the parallel in the Rashi in 31, that uh, you should have a heaviness of the head and not a lightheadedness. Um, that's the idea of uh, this idea of uh, submission. In other words, Rav will go ahead and define it as reverence and submission. And that's, that's going to be, you know, because again, when we're talking about this idea of submission, what does that word mean? How do we define it? Because it says that we should do it, but what is it? So again, you know, the Rashi writes that, you know, it's a heaviness of the head. It's not a lightheadedness. 
and it's reverence and submission. That's the idea. The Gemara continues, or the Mishnah continues, says the pious ones of old, upon having at the place at which they intended to pray, would tarry for one hour and only then pray. And the, the Mishnah continues, says, in order that they might direct their hearts to the omnipresent. So, in other words, what this is saying is that they would, um, when in the Talmud, when it says the, a term like Sha'ah, okay, it's really talking about a figure of speech to mean a short time. Uh, normally, it's not meant literally. However, uh, here it is. Here it actually is used literally. So, uh, really what they would be doing was they would be uh, pausing for literally an hour. Uh, and this would be for the, you know, the real Hasidim of old. These are the real pious ones of old. And other people who have, you know, difficulty concentrating, you know, it would be sufficient for them uh, to pause an amount of time that it takes to wait, to uh, walk eight tefachim. So again, there's a pause. Eight tefachim is not very far. Okay, a tefach is about if you hold up your fist, and it's about the width of the fist. So, um, ironically, uh, it's it's uh, one tefach less than the uh, aron with without the lid on. So the the aron akodesh is ten tefachim. Without the lid is one tefach. Without the lid, it'll be nine tefach, and so one less. It'll be eight tefachim. So the distance is not very far, but again, what you're trying to do is, for today, get a pause so that you can get your head into what you have to do with this prayer. And so it's contrasting, you know, as to really show you, you know, how great our grandfathers were, and to inspire you, not to make you feel bad, but to, to give you inspiration to take what you're doing more seriously. That's why this is in here. However, the eight tefachim is what it generally is to be today. Now, why would that be? They would think about it for an hour to think about the the totality of Hashem and the fleeting nature of uh, the person. And it's to take out of their mind all of the earthly things is to really get their head into connecting with this Ain Old Mulvado and the taking away the distractions of earthly things, sometimes, you know, work things, sometimes money issues, sometimes relationship issues or parenting issues. So take all that stuff out and really just concentrate to Hashem and Hashem alone. Now, there's going to be additional laws about somebody who is standing in prayer. The Gemara says... Even if the king inquires as to the welfare while he is engaged in prayer, he should not answer him. So why would it be? Because you're in front of the king of kings. So if some earthly king comes to you and asks, Hey, you know, Shlomo, how you doing? You ignore him because you are in front of the biggest and totalist, you know, only king there really is. This is just a man. Yeah, he's a king, but he's just a man. Um, you are standing in front of the king of kings. And so, you know, he, the king of kings, comes before anything. So the Gemara, the Mishnah continues, says, and even if a snake is coiled around the heel, he should not interrupt his prayer. Uh, the snake here, they're using a snake here to say on the shot level, like, oh, you know, if there's something that's serious, you should not interrupt your prayer. But really here, uh, this is talking about, you know, two different things. There's a remez here for two different things. One is the snake, which is the Yetzirah, or if it's, um, you know, the evil inclination is known as the snake. So that really what this is saying is that even if you're totally overwhelmed by ideas from the Yetzirah, that you should not interrupt your prayer. Interrupt your prayer doesn't mean to stop praying and we'll walk away. An interruption in prayer is totally changing the concentration that you have of the prayer while you are in the prayer. So that, you know, you should not be sitting there 
getting distracted by the Yetahara. You should not be sitting there letting the imagination, which is a part of the mind, start to wander and start to think about um, things that you know are are not related to the prayer. And that's one of the ways to look at you know the snake coiled around your heel. And another another way to look at it is that you know if you know you knock down the sages the the fences that the sages put up a snake will it says a snake will bite you on the heel a snake will bite you that's a theme that comes up in all the shasas and the midrashim again and again and again and in fact you know there are a lot of you know there are a lot of um, uh, rabbinical things that are in the Shemona Esra, and so that really what you know this is also hinting at is that if you're not doing those rabbinical parts within the prayer itself, it's kind of like an interruption. In other words, really what it's saying is that you need to be doing the rabbinical parts and not knock down a fence that the rabbis put up because you will be bit by a snake. And these parts of the prayer are essential. And these parts of the prayer that the rabbis put in, like, you know, where to put in your, you know, personal request, like at which point to straighten up, like, you know, putting in the part for the heretics by by Shmuel HaKatan, like having to have the idea of reverence and the idea of having a clean mind while you pray. These are all things that are essential parts of the prayer and you shouldn't be knocking them down. And so that's another idea about, you know, the snake coiled around your heel and that you should not interrupt your prayer not interrupting your prayer, meaning here that you should be continuing with the right frame of mind. The Gemara now is going to say that one should not stand to pray the Shemona Esrei except amid an attitude of submission. And what would this attitude be? And the Gemara now is going to talk about a situation where you don't have the frame of mind and you're not allowed to pray. Rabbi Yirmiya in the Gemara says, in the name of Rabbi Abba, one who returns from a journey is forbidden to pray immediately because he is unsettled from his travels. And the Gemara says, and what is the scriptural basis for this law? And it says, therefore, hear this now afflicted, oh, uh, this afflicted one, hear, here, sorry, let me read this again. Therefore, hear this now afflicted one, drunk, but not from wine. That's in Yeshayahu 51.21. In other words, he's saying that um, just as somebody who's drunk from wine is not allowed to pray, so too someone who is drunk from agitation from a journey is going to be forbidden to pray. So you really can't be distracted. And if you're, you know, basically, you know, this Gemara forbidding somebody to pray after a journey, um, it's implying that, um, that the person has to spend a little bit of time to recover from that fatigue and to get settled again. And, um, you know, you should check the, the uh, Halachala Misa in the Shulchan Aruch to get a sense of, um, you know, what it would be for uh, an average person and for uh, what is going to be for the day. In other words, how long uh, should you wait um, because you don't want to wait too long. And, you know, the question is going to be like, well, what, you know, what point did you get over it? So check the Shulchan Aruch on it. The Gemara is going to talk about a second situation. Again, it's bringing up these situations so that, you know, we can get a sense of how we really have to have a clear head when we pray. So the Gemara says, Rabbi Zerikon says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, in the name of Rabbi Elazar, the son of Rabbi Yose Haglili, one who is distressed is forbidden to pray. It is unreasonable to derive this law from anywhere other than this verse. Therefore, hear this now, afflicted one, drunk, but not from wine. In other words, okay, we know that somebody who is drunk is not allowed to pray. But also, what about somebody who's, who's like so afflicted with their body in a way, it's like they're drunk. They're not drunk from inebriation, but that they're, 
their head is so far away from connecting to a Kodesh Baruch Hu, just like uh, somebody who's unsettled from just returning from a trip or someone who is, um, you know, has, has been drinking, that their, you know, their head is out of it. And so someone who is uh, really distressed, uh, you know, it's, it's um, you know, the question is going to be, you know, how much, you know, distress and things like that. The, the mission now requires only that one get a submissive frame of mind before rising to pray. And the Barisa wants to add an additional requirement. And the Gemara says that a Barisa teaches one should not stand to pray Shimon Esrei, neither from amid words of ridicule, nor from amid laughter, nor from amid an attitude of irreverence, nor from amid idle chatter. Rather, one should rise to pray from amid words of Torah. So that is going to be the ideal, and it's really teaching us uh, things that you know, we have to uh, uh, take mind of why would that be? Because um, you're you're looking at a list of things that can unsettle the mind. So, like in terms of laughter, right? It might not be laughter from ridicule, because that was in the, li the list. In other words, amid words of ridicule, that you know, perhaps you're talking to somebody who's mocking the Torah, or you're talking to somebody who is. Um, making fun of you or making fun of something else or downgrading the religion, God forbid. And, you know, this is not an appropriate way or time to say the Shimon Esrei. Really, it makes you unsettled. And so really what you should do is you should walk away, calm down, and then, you know, get the right frame of mind. You know, maybe you want to be like one of the, you know, the Hasidim of old, where they would go and they would concentrate on things for an hour literally an hour, to go and get in the right frame of mind before going and praying. And also idle chatter. Idle chatter um, is going to be where it's going to be the opposite of a submissive frame of mind. And idle chatter is going to be a thing of levity. And, and that does unsettle the mind. And so what, what happens is that when you're coming in with this unsettled mind, you're going to have a hard time doing the prayer in the right way. And that's why it's saying to take a pause, step back, get in the right frame of mind, and then go, go do it. So, you know, this is a list, again, of the things where one should not stand to pray. Shimon Esra, this is what the Bryce is teaching. It says, neither from amid words of ridicule, nor from amid laughter, nor amid an attitude of irreverence. Uh, that would be, you know, perhaps lightheadedness or the opposite of, submission, nor from amid idle chatter. Rather, one should rise to pray the Shemona Esrei from amid words of Torah. So uh, in order to fill the requirement, um, you know, you, you have to have the right frame of mind. The Gemara now is going to con uh, continue with a similar halacha. And the Gemara says, likewise, a man should not take leave of his friend neither from amid words of ridicule, nor from amid laughter, uh, nor from amid an attitude of reverence, nor from amid idle chatter. Rather, one should take leave of his friend from amid words of Torah. For thus we find uh, with the early prophets that they would conclude their works with words of praise and with words of consolation. So they're looking at the Derech Eretz of the early prophets, and these are the people who lived in the earlier uh, generation. This is not um, referring specifically to um, the books of the earlier prophets, like in uh, the book of uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. Not referring to that. It's talking about um, earlier prophets per se, and that um, even when they're sitting there laying out all the punishments that's going to come to Am Yisrael because of sin. The prophets were always careful to conclude their words on an up note, an encouraging note. And so that's what you should be learning from, right? You should be, you know, leaving your friend from discussing something of Torah. That's one. And second, you should do you should do it because that is the Derek Eretz. That is the way that the early prophets conducted themselves. And the second thing is that you want to do some sort of thing where you're ending on a 
word of praise or you're ending on a positive note because you know people are wired to remember about a time or about a person the last thing that is said and so whatever that last thing is said that's what the person generally is going to remember about you so if you are having you know words of ridicule or laughter and silliness and irreverence or idle chatter then that is what people are going to think of you that's what people are going to remember you as and so you really should switch it and switch it back to words of torah at the end or you know words of torah and praise and words of consolation and that is going to elevate you people are going to have a higher regard for you because that is in line with how the human brain works people you know don't like to you know have a uh, depressing note and people like to always hear something that's encouraging and you know you should always try to take leave of, of, of you know words of uh, praise and consolation and Torah and that's going to be the better way to do it in your own life and you know that's a good thing of Derech Eretz and you know we always want to stay away from arrogance and idle chatter and uh, you know it's also better for your personal relationships as well people will think uh, think of you in a better way and so that's why this Gemara is in here the Brisa now is going to um, talk about the early prophets how they concluded their words with praise and consolation and it would talk about it's going to talk about three prophetic works that do not seem to follow that rule. Okay, it's going to talk about what looks like the exception here. The Gemara says, Rabbi Elazar said the Baraisa statement that the early prophets concluded their works with words of praise and consolation is true of all the prophets, except for the prophet uh, Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah um, who did conclude with words of reprimand. So this is, this is going to be one person's opinion. Um, in other words, the idea here is that it's going to be talking about a, uh, a topic that's uh, stressful and distressing, and that would be the final chapter uh, in 52, describing how Nebuchadnezzar uh, and his army conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple and captured the king. Now, that seems to be distressing. So what's going on here? Well, Rabbi Yochanan is going to disagree with that. Okay, Rabbi Yochanan said to him um, that uh, Jeremiah, uh, Yeremiah, uh, also concluded with words of consolation, as did the other prophets, where it says, Omar says, for he said, thus shall uh, Babel sink. And until this point are the prophecies of uh, Jeremiah. In other words, in Jeremiah 51 to 64, which is the, you know, the ultimate chapter in the book, it's a prophecy that's talking about the downfall of Bava. And the final, final verse in 64 states, and you shall say, thus shall Bava sink and not rise because of the evil that I am bringing against it. In other words, that because it is directed against you know, the enemies of Israel is considered a prophecy of consolation. And um, Rabbi Yochanan considers this and not the last chapter of uh, Jeremiah to be Jeremiah's final prophecy. In other words, that it's slightly before what Rabbi Elazar is pointing out. The Gemara is going to elaborate and it's going to say that uh, considering that Jeremiah repeated uh, repeatedly prophesied concerning the destruction of the temple, it might be thought that he would also conclude with a prophecy concerning the destruction of the temple. And the scripture therefore states, after his prophecy concerning the downfall of Bava, until this point are the prophecies of Jeremiah. From this verse, we see that he concluded his prophecy with the downfall of his nation's destroyers. That's going to be Bava. And thus, he did not conclude with words of reprimand, but rather consolation. Why would that be? Because he's basically concluding it in uh, chapter 
51, not 52. It does end on 52, but it ends, he's effectively saying that, you know, this idea that the Torah doesn't always follow a, uh, a strict chronological order, says the Haredim, and that really that at, because of that, you know, in this narrative, that, you know, chapter 51 is going to be the final uh, prophecy, not necessarily chapter 52. That's really the point of Rabbi Yochanan. So the uh, scripture is very hard to um, to understand, and that's why uh, that's why um, you know you need the Meforshim to help you understand it, and that's why you can't just read uh, you know the books of the prophets by yourself and, and get any understanding. You know, there's a religion that does that. They do try to read these things without Meforshim and understanding. And, you know, you, you look at how lost they get in their understanding uh, because, um, you know, they don't read Hebrew and, you know, they don't have Meforshim because they don't believe in it. And, you know, what do you expect from a bunch of people who eat pork and cheeseburgers and, you know, are uncircumcised to try to just sit down and read this and, you know, get this, you know, stomp without any of the tools to help. Um, you know, it's it's impossible. Now, the Gemara asks about another book of scripture that uh, does not seem to conclude with words of consolation. So the Gemara continues, says, but it is written in the final verse of Yeshiyahu, uh, and they will lie in disgrace before all mankind. So where is this talking about? This is talking about the end of Yeshiyahu in 66.24. And the Gemara is going to answer. It's going to say that the above verse is referring to the idol worshippers. And the punishment of idol worshippers is a consolation for the world. And really what this is trying to point out is that this is not talking about an end for Am Yisrael. That, that they shall lie in disgrace before all of mankind. This is talking about the idol worshippers, that they will lie in disgrace. And, you know, may it be, you know, that, that uh, you know, the end of Christianity comes quickly. Anyway, the Gemara asks about yet another book of scripture. And it says that, uh, you know, but it is written in the final verse of Lamentations, for even if you had utterly rejected us. Now, this is going to be in Lamentations, it's going to be in chapter 5, 22. And the Gemara is going to answer that. And it's going to talk about, you know, that really this book should be understood as a continuation of the prayer that precedes it, rather than a lament. In other words, you should, you should read it in context as a whole thing. And basically... In the ultimate verse, we're asking, says the Gemara, bring us back to you, Hashem, and we will return, renew our days of old. And then in the final verse, we explain why we feel we can make this request, because even if you had utterly rejected us, says the Gemara, you have already raged sufficiently against us. Now, let's look at the Haredim to understand this. Basically, the ultimate verse of Lamentations does speak of consolation. It says, bring us back to you, Hashem, and we shall return, renew our days as of old. And the final verse states, for even if you had utterly rejected us, you have already raged sufficiently against us. And the Gemara explains that the final verse is to be understood as justification of our request, not a reprimand. So in other words, this idea of bring us back to you, Hashem, says Haredim, is because in spite of all your rage, uh, we have not forsaken you. And that's why it's, you know, talking about, you know, consolation. You know, in Yeshiyahu and Lamentations, says the Haredim that, you know, they're ending with words of consolation, not reprimand. And um, the Tosafot in Barachot 31a, the Bavli version, points out that Malachi uh, and, uh, and uh, Kohelet the final verses are also going to be a consolation because they discuss God's judgment and they do not refer to his judgment of Israel, but the judgment of the wicked. So, so you know, judgment of the wicked, 
Well, that's that's good news. That's that's great, right? So, you know, that's a that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. It's bad if you're wicked. It's not it's not bad if you're religious and you're holding on to you know Judaism. Now, I want to point out a couple of the other uh, verses now. So, in the end of Yeshayahu sixty six twenty three and twenty four talks about uh, the messianic era and says it shall be at it shall be that at every new moon and every Shabbos all mankind will come to prostrate themselves before me and then it says Hashem in in uh, Pasuk 24 it says and they will go out and see the corpses of men who rebelled against me for their decay will not cease and their fire will not be extinguished and they will lie in disgrace before all mankind well yeah, that's bad if you're you're a wicked person. That's not bad if you're Jewish and observing. So that's actually a consolation because you know you're going to see what's going to be happening to you know all the Christians who persecuted you know the Jews and and continue to with all their you know um, missionizing and everything else. And you know you look at the end of Malachi in three twenty three and twenty four, and you know again it's the same concept. It says you know. Malachi, it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Hashem. Well, that sounds good to me. And line 24 says, And he will turn back to God the hearts of fathers with their sons and the hearts of sons with their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with utter, utter destruction. Well, that sounds good too. It means that all the people, fathers and sons, are going to turn back to the you know, the following back to Hashem, which is great. And, uh, you know, the, you know, in the end of Kohelet chapter 12, line 13, 14 says the sum of the matter when all has been considered, it says fear Hashem and keep his commandments for that is man's whole duty for Hashem will judge every deed, even everything hidden, whether good or evil. So that is, is going to be really something of consolation because guess what? It's it's talking about all of mankind. It's not talking about Israel there, right? That's the point, right? And so, you know, all of these hidden things and, you know, hidden things like people in their hearts following idolatry and things like that, well, that's going to be the judgment of, of the rest of mankind and that's going to be the calling of the wicked. That's great. So those are, those are consolations. Those are not things to feel bad about. And let's get into, uh, you know, the next topic, which is going to be talking about, um, you know, the Bryce's statement that a person should, should leave his friend only from words of Torah. And so the Gemara says, so too Eliyahu took leave of Elisha only from words of, mid words of Torah. And the verse states, as they were walking and conversing, and by the way, the word there is going to be vedaber, uh, it says, Behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated between the two of them, and Eliyahu ascended to heaven in the whirlwind. And from here we see that Eliyahu and Elijah were discussing matters of Torah immediately before uh, Elijah ascended to heaven. Now we're in something agotic and wonderful. Um, the Gemara is explaining that the word vedaber means that they were discussing specifically words of Torah. They were talking about something with the topic of Torah. That's why the word vedaber is there. Now, when you go and you look in Bereshit and you look at um, where Vedaber pops up, you'll see a lot of um, connection between that and this. Okay, so the Gemara asks, it says, in what specific topic of Torah were they involved? And the Gemara gives four answers to the question. The first answer, Rabbi Ahava, the son of Rabbi Zera, says they were involved with the recitation of the Shema. And we know this from that which is stated concerning the recitation of the Shema. And it says, and you shall speak the Debarta of them. That's going to be the words of the Shema. Now, the word we had there was the Deber. And that was used 
in the verse to describe the conversation between Eliyahu and Navi and Elisha. And so the son of Rabbi Zerah is saying that this is an allusion to the Shema because it uses a similar term, a term or a conjugation of it, which is uh, Vedabarta. Okay, so that's one way. Now, this one is going to get uh, a little bit agotic. So, and again, you know, whenever you go and you look in the first book of the Torah in, in uh, Bereshit, uh, you're going to see Venda Bear and other uh, forms of it come up. And so these sages are, are looking at uh, these other forms. So Rabbi Yuza, Yuda Ben Pazi said, they were involved in talking about the creation of the world. So that's going to be in the Bereshit process itself, basically. Uh, and the Gemara says, For it is stated concerning the creation of the world by the word, where it says, uh, Bidvar, of Hashem, the heavens were made. So the word that the bear in the verse is describing Eliyahu's conversation with Elisha, and it's alluding to this verse, which has a similar term, term which is uh, bidvar. So that's so that's going to be one explanation. The third answer, Rabbi Yudan, the son of Rabbi Ivu, says they were involved with the consolation of Jerusalem. In other words, that's going to be the messianic process. And the Gemara says, For it is stated concerning the consolation of Jerusalem, speak uh, Dabru to the heart of Jerusalem. And this is going to be from Yeshiyahu 40 uh, in the second Pasuk. Okay, so it's using Dabru over there. That's going to be a similar um, uh, word. Uh, and that's why there, this this. Uh, the Samara is saying that they were talking about the consolation and the messianic process. The fourth answer, um, really a spectacular answer, uh, draws an illusion from elsewhere. And the Gemara says that the sages said they were involved with the matters of the Masa Merkava, that's going to be the chariot. And we know this from that which is stated in the verses uh, quoted above. As they were walking and conversing, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated between the two of them, and Elijah ascended to heaven in the whirlwind. Now, the chariot mentioned in the verse is going to be an allusion to the subject that they were talking about. That's the point of the sages. Now, let's look at the Pnei Moshe to understand this. So, basically, okay, he's saying that, you know, behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire is going to be explained as pertaining to uh, the previous clause over there in the Merkava as well. And it's written, it's like it's written that, you know, they were walking and conversing about a chariot of fire and horses of fire. In other words, about the Merkava itself, that's the divine chariot. Behold, a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared, separated between the two of them. That's the Point of Pnei Moshe. Now, I want to I want to point out something that in uh, in other places in the Torah, when people are successfully able to, you can find this in uh, in uh, Yerushalmi Chagiga chapter two halacha one. That when people are successfully understanding really the Merkava, that you see amazing things happen, and so really when you when you go open up in your Shami Chagiga chapter two halacha one, you see what uh, what happens when other people who successfully understand it can explain it. What happens? Um, it it's basically the same thing. That's really what the sages are effectively saying is that um, just like over there, these are the things, that, amazing things that happen, and over here, uh, you know, Eli, Eliyahu and Navi understood it in the deepest possible way, a total way. And as he was actually explaining it, the chariot themselves came. That's that's going to be the, the idea from the sages. Now, the Gemara now is going to talk about that one should get, get up to pray 
amid words of Torah, and it's going to, you know, it's going to talk about this law a little bit more. And the Gemara says that Rabbi Yermia said one should not stand to pray the Shemona Esrei except amid a clear-cut halachic ruling. So why would that be? Okay. So the idea is that you know it would be something that doesn't require analysis. And why would that be? The Haredim says so that one will not be tempted to reflect on it while praying. So um, the idea here is that you know we should try to have a clear mind. You know, and even you know the halacha that you last discussed should even be clear, so that you're not sitting there chewing on it while you're trying to pray. Again, you don't want distraction. That's the key idea here, and it's really teaching you. You know, hey, you were talking about words of Torah, right? But that, you know, even after talking about words of Torah, that you should be doing it in a way where you're, you're still, your mind is going to be clear. That's the point, okay? That no matter how you're approaching the prayer, even from words of Torah, that you should do whatever it takes that your mind is clear while you pray. The Gemara now cites a second related law in the name of Rabbi Yermia. Gemara says, Rabbi Rav Yermia, this is going to be a Babylonian uh, rabbi, said, one who is involved in the needs of the community is like one involved in the words of Torah, and he may commence his prayer from amid such dealings. So uh, the Haredim says about this that just as one may rise to pray from amid words of Torah, so too one may rise to pray from amid involvement in the community affairs. And this would be because the words of the Torah involvement in the community affairs serves to put one in the proper frame of mind for prayer. That's the idea from Haredim to explain this verse so we can understand it in a clearer way. Um, so Rabbi Yeremia um, says that you know one may stand to uh, pray only from a clear-cut halachic ruling. The Gemara now is going to give five examples. Uh, here's the first example. Rabbi Huna would first recite the halacha that a woman who sees a drop of uh, blood the size of a mustard seed waits seven days because of it, and then he would arise and pray. So the idea is that, you know, under biblical law, there's no situation in which uh, a woman who sees a drop of blood uh, must wait seven clean days. Uh, for if she sees the blood during her needed days, she may immerse herself after seven days, regardless of how many discharges she experiences during that time. And uh, if she sees it during her Ziva days, she may immerse herself only after one clean day. Only if uh, she sees blood on uh, three consecutive days during her Ziva days, must she wait seven clean days. Uh, but, in, but since in many instances it's difficult to determine whether the discharge was of a Nita or Ziva type. Um, it was agreed that the stringencies of both types be applied to any discharge, thereby obviating the need to make a determination. Um, so that, you know, therefore it became a custom that if a woman experiences even a small discharge, she becomes uh, Tame for seven days, like a Nita, and that the period which uh, must elapse before she can purify herself to become clean. It's going to be like a zava. So uh, this is a fence around that, and you can see um, that really this is like a clear-cut thing in order to make sure that um, people are not sitting there, you know, being with the nida, and um, to to make sure that um, you know to to make sure that. You know, there's not going to be any confusion there. And that you could see that, you know, it would be easy without this fence to have a lot of confusion and mix it up, especially for people who are not uh, learned. And to get to that level of learning where you could determine that would be a huge feat. And I don't think there would be a lot of people who would be able to do it or be available to judge it and effectively they, they're, they're putting this fence in to, to just make sure that people are, um, you know, going to be okay with the laws of Nita. And so, the, the, you know, you can see it's very important, and that's why he would just, you know, rise up and pray at that point, because, you know, in talking about this, this is a clear-cut thing, and you can see that, 
you know, the logic of it for why you need to have it is just very obvious. And that's why Rav Huna would, you know, expound that and then get up and pray because it's just obvious. So the second example, uh, Zohar bar Hanina said, the law that one who lets blood from a sanctified animal and benefits from the blood has committed mila uh, is also one of the clear-cut halachot from a mitch one is allowed to stand up and pray. So this is going to be somebody who accidentally makes a personal use of the sanctified blood uh, that you know you, you have to bring the sanctified blood. That's that's a biblical requirement. That's to write it, right? Um, and and we also know that it's the um, the application of the blood that that uh, you know that triggers the the offering to be a valid offering. So you know what happens basically if that you've sanctified this animal and you've taken the blood, which is now sanctified, um, and and now you're using the blood. Well, that's that's meila. That that is very straightforward. Um, and so, you know, I want to I want to look at the Haredim to help explain it, so it's even more clear cut. Um, the blood of an offering says the Haredim is not subject to mila. This applies. Uh, this, however, applies only when the blood, which emerges from the animal uh, that is slaughtered as a sacrifice, in the temple courtyard. Such blood is destined to be thrown on the altar, as it is stated regarding the blood. Okay, and that's going to be in. Uh, Leviticus 17.11 says, I have assigned it for you to atone upon the altar, which implies to atone, but not for meila. So blood extracted from a live sacrificial animal through bloodletting, however, is subject to meila because it is unfit to be put on the altar and is considered as part of the body of the animal itself. So in other words, what the Haredim is pointing out is that... Um, you have you have an animal that's sanctified, okay, and now you're taking the blood out to go do something else, but you didn't slaughter it yet. So in this case, uh, this blood would would basically be mila because it's already been sanctified, it's already been designated. So because of that, that would be mila, that would be clear cut. And then he would go and pray. A third example, it was taught in Abraisa, Bar Kapara said, the fact that there are 11 days between one Nita period and the next Nita period is a law that was transmitted orally to Moses at Sinai and not derived from a scriptural verse. And this is also one of the clear-cut halachot uh, from amid which one may arise to pray. Um, in other words, that the 11 day period of potential ziva during which a discharge of blood would render her a ziva, okay? And then the fourth example, Rabbi Hoshaya taught in Abraisa, a person may amass a mixture of grain and straw and be crafty with it so that so as to exempt the grain from the requirement of tithes. So I want to look at... Uh, I want to look at this for a second. So the Haredim, here's what the Haredim says about this. Um, so a person may be crafty by bringing the mixture into his house before he separates the grain from the straw so that he will not be able to use it to feed the animals without having separate mice from it. Okay. Now, here's what the Haredim says. The Haredim says that since the produce never became subject to the mice obligation, one should be permitted to eat the produce himself and not just feed it to his animal. And indeed, this is true of the biblical level. Under rabbinic law, it is forbidden to make a regular meal of produce that has not uh, been tithed even before it has been smooth. Uh, only informal consumption or feeding to animals uh, is permitted. And accordingly, even when produce is brought into the house without becoming subject to biblical miser, it remain subject to the rabbinical restrictions. And that's why Rav Hoshaya mentions this as a permit in, in feeding it for animals and why it would be, uh, quote-unquote, obvious. In other words, and then he would see this as a clear-cut thing and arise to pray. And a fifth and final example is that um, Abdan inquired of Rebbe, how many levels of Tuma can be transmitted uh, to Kodesh 
And Rebbe answered him, four. Abdon then inquired of Rebbe, and how many levels of Tuma could be transmitted to Truma? And Rebbe answered him, three. And Abdon then arose and prayed. In other words, that this is a clear-cut halakha, which, you know, after you hear this, this is basics, A, B, C, of Jewish law, and it was very, very clear-cut. You can arise and pray because um, it's not going to make you sit and th think about it. This is a, a thing by definition. Um, so that's a, a very, a very uh, amazing, amazing idea. And I want to just uh, finish up with something on um, divine pro providence. So the Gemara changes topics and says, in order to increase one's awareness of divine providence, the Gemara enjoins us to constantly repeat a certain verse. And uh, Rabbi Hiskia says in the name of Rabbi Yaakov bar Ada, and Rav Yasa said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, the verse should never depart from your mouth, where it says, Hashem, Master of Legions, is with us. A stronghold for us is the God of Jacob, Selah. Now, um, that's going to be from uh, Tehillim 46.12. And um, you can find this in the Ashkenaz prayer book uh, in the beginning of it. And in the Sephardi prayer book, this was added to the end of the Sephardi prayer book by the RE. And this is a uh, thing for trying to see more divine providence in your life. And that basically, according to Rabbi Yochanan, that it should be repeated many times and you should be trying to say it with a lot of kavana. So... The Gemara explains about this and says, in order to increase one's trust in Hashem, the Gemara enjoins one to constantly repeat, constantly repeat another verse. Rabbi Yosef, son of Rabbi Avin, Rabbi Bahu, in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, and the students of the academy said that the following verse should never depart your mouth, where it says, Hashem, master of legions, praiseworthy is a man who trusts in you. This is in Tehillim 84.13. And, you know, this is, you know, this is introduced into the daily prayers in many points. And it's also uh, part, it's being put together uh, with the last prayer in the prayer books. And the Gemara uh, enjoins one to constantly recite a certain prayer. Rabbi Hiskia, in the name of Rabbi Yabahu, says in the name that the following prayer should be constantly recited. By the way, Rabbi Abahu was the student of Rabbi Yochanan, so probably this also is coming from Rabbi Yochanan since this is a student. So, you know, you can see the first two came from Rabbi Yochanan, and, uh, you know, in the last one, you know, it said Rabbi Abahu in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Here, Rabbi Hiskia in the name of Rabbi Abahu, who is the student of um, Rabbi Yochanan, is saying the following prayer should be constantly recited. And it says, May it be your will, Hashem, our God and God of our forefathers, that you shall save us from the irrepressible, difficult, evil times which go forth and which rush to enter the world. So um, unlike the past ones which are using verses, this prayer does not appear on our prayer service. Um, but... Um, it does appear uh, in the Havdalah recited by the Sephardim. Uh, and uh, also in the, the Tefillis Haderach. So uh, something very important about trying to concentrate on uh, divine providence. Now, tomorrow we're going to get into uh, trying to have the right frame of mind for this idea of submission. This idea of trying to come in with this, um, the, the proper mindset from the point of view of the tradition. And this tradition goes all the way back to Moshe Rabbeinu. That, that prayer, something that's always existed for Am Yisrael and for the patriarchs and matriarchs. But how do you pray? And what mindset should you be in when you're praying? And so we're going to get into uh, a deeper explanation tomorrow about this idea of the attitude of submission and this idea of 
that frame of mind so you can elevate your prayer. Have a great day.